Having rejected the Anaconda Plan, Brigadier General Irving McDowell was appointed commander of the Department of Northeastern Virginia, which included the Army of Northeastern Virginia. His army of 35,000 troops consisted of five divisions. The first division led by Brigadier General Daniel Tyler. The second was led by Colonel David Hunter. The third, Colonel Samuel P. Heitelman. And the fourth division, Brigadier General Theodore Runyon. The fifth division, Colonel Dixon S. Miles. President Abraham Lincoln, under public and political pressure, ordered McDowell to begin offensive operations. The general initially objected, claiming the men were not ready. Lincoln reassured him with the words, You are green, it is true, but they are green also. You are all green alike. Although McDowell had served in the Mexican War, he had not commanded troops and had spent most of his military career in the general staff. His promotions come largely from his political connections with the Secretary of State, Sam and Chase. A second army, located northwest of Washington, under the command of Major General Robert Patterson. His force consisted of 18,000 men. Patterson was a veteran of both wars of 1812 and the Mexican War. Under his command was Major General Cal Wallader of the 1st Division and Major General Kaim of the 2nd Division. Meanwhile, 25 miles to the southwest, Brigadier General P.G.T. Beauregard, labelled the hero of Fort Sumter, had under his command between 22 and 25,000 troops, titled the Army of the Potomac. Under his command was Brigadier General Bonham of the 1st Brigade, Brigadier Ewell of the 2nd Brigade, Brigadier Jones of the 3rd Brigade, Brigadier Longstreet of the 4th Brigade, Colonel Cook of the 5th Brigade, Colonel Early of the 6th Brigade, Colonel Evans of the 7th Brigade, and Brigadier Holmes of the Reserve Brigade. To his northeast held the Army of the Shenandoah, under the command of Brigadier General Joseph E. Johnston, which consisted of around 12,000 men. Under his command was Brigadier General Jackson of the 1st Brigade, Colonel Bartow of the 2nd Brigade, Brigadier General B. Jr. of the 3rd Brigade, Brigadier Smith of the 4th Brigade, Captain Stannard of the Artillery, and Colonel Stewart of the Cavalry. Sixteenth July eighteen sixty one, General McDowell set off from Washington with his thirty five thousand men, hoping to relieve pressure of the Confederate forces that were very close to Washington. His plan was to move west in three columns. Two columns would attack the Confederate army at Bull Run, while the third column would make a flanking manoeuvre around the Confederates' right flank to the south, cutting them off from the railroad to Richmond while threatening their rear. McDowell had hoped to have his army at Centerville, east of Bull Run by seventeenth of July. But his newly formed army, unaccustomed to marching and taking orders, would often wander off to pick fruit from the ground. Meanwhile, Major General Patterson's men were to engage Johnson's army of the Shenandoah to prevent them from reinforcing Beauregard's army. After two days of marching in the summer sun, McDowell's northeastern Virginia army rested up in Centerville. He dispatched Brigadier General Theodore Runyon with 5,000 men to protect the army's rear. Meanwhile, Beauregard had set his forces up defensively along the Bull Run River, stretching from east of Groveton at the cross junction next to Stonehouse and the west of Union Mills. Brigadier General Daniel Tyler was ordered on July the 18th to march southeast to find a way around the Confederate right flank, while keeping up the impression that Union forces were moving to Manassas. Two companies of Colonel Richardson's 4th Brigade, along with a squadron of cavalry, were dispatched with orders to probe south and recon. He would clash at Blackburn's Ford against the Confederates Brigadier General James Longstreet in command of Army of Potomac's 4th Brigade. To Longstreet's south hurried Colonel Early in charge of the 6th Brigade. By late morning, Tyler was in a position overlooking Blackburn's Ford on Bull Run. Although he observed a Confederate battery cross the run, rebel troops could not be detected in any strength. Tyler called forward his artillery and Richardson's entire infantry brigade, composed of 1st Massachusetts, 12th New York, 2nd Michigan, and 3rd Michigan, the latter two regiments being deployed facing Mitchell's Ford. Tyler's guns opened fire shortly after noon but received no response. Determined to feel out the enemy, Tyler directed Richardson to advance a line of skirmishers. Upon approaching the wooded stream banks, the 1st Massachusetts drew scattering shots from skirmishers of the 1st Virginia Infantry. In response, Tyler sent forward a section of 12-pounder field howitzers from Captain Airy's battery, with a squadron of cavalry for support. Richardson also directed the 12th New York and the 1st Massachusetts to move forward in support of the artillery pieces. As the two howitzers opened fire, the entire stream bottom erupted with volleys of musketry fire. 
the New Yorkers becoming under heavy fire began to fall back in disorder, dangerously exposing the left flank of the 1st Massachusetts. Captain Ares recalled his exposed pair of houses after dispensing their ammunition. Satisfied that the enemy was present in strong force, Tyler ordered Richardson's battered infantry to withdraw. Meanwhile, Captain Ares' six guns, assisted by two pounder parrot rifles, kept up a steady but mostly ineffective artillery exchange with Confederate batteries until 4pm. General Tyler reported 83 casualties, with General Beauregard noted a total of 68 killed and wounded in this relatively small affair. The disorderly withdrawal of many Union troops, however, contributed to the perception of a Confederate victory, and left Southern troops flush with confidence. Although General McDowell severely criticised Tyler for aggressively exceeding his orders, the Union repulse at Blackburn's Ford did yield valuable information to the Union commander. The sharp firefight revealed that the Confederate position along the stretch of Bull Run was formidably defended, and this knowledge contributed to McDowell's decision to focus the Union efforts elsewhere along the Confederate line. Yet the battle at Blackburn's Ford would serve only as a minor prelude to greater bloodshed and a much more decisive defeat for Union forces just a little further upstream on July the 21st, 1861.